It's been called the perfect killing machine, a terrifying blend of both biological and what appear to be mechanical elements, and all designed with a single purpose, to spread throughout the galaxy like an extraordinarily efficient virus, and using humans as its means of propagation. Now, you might think that all this sounds pretty bad, and you'd be right. The xenomorph, as it is known, is a uniquely capable predator. But what interests me is the study of how this creature works. How can an organism withstand the vacuum of space? How can its circulatory system be made of acid? And why does it have a second set of jaws within its mouth? These, dear traveler, are the questions this expedition seeks to answer. But I am getting ahead of myself. I am Dr. Felix Nebula, and to you I say, welcome aboard the dimension-hopping bioship Manta. Now, please strap yourselves in. We're about to dissect the anatomy of nightmares and explore how every aspect of this creature has been honed for one purpose, survival at any cost. Approaching the wreckage of the Nostromo now, what exactly are we looking for? Good question, Manta. We've come to this time in this dimension for one purpose, to find an adult xenomorph, though hopefully not so alive that it would prove dangerous. While I was watching a documentary from a version of 2024, an idea occurred to me. Why not seek out the very creature that was allegedly destroyed by one Lieutenant First Class Ellen Ripley? Ah yes, a very original idea, and it seems to have worked. Specimen located. Excellent. Manta, please bring the specimen on board. Don't worry, dear traveler. We are in no danger. Our advanced teleportation and stasis technology is made possible through the patented OmniGrab Array. Please feel free to get closer. All right, maybe not that close. Now, as you'll notice, Xenomorph XX1, as it is known, possesses one of the most striking and alien morphologies ever documented. Its body plan is broadly humanoid, standing at an average of seven to nine feet tall and covered in a nearly black exoskeleton. At first glance, this exoskeleton appears similar to that of terrestrial arthropods, but of course, it's much more than that. This exoskeleton's outer layer is composed of protein polysaccharides, creating a structure much like chitin, but far more robust. I'm detecting an unusual structure within the exoskeleton. Is that? Polarized silicon, that's right. This particular integration grants the creature exceptional environmental resistance allowing it to withstand extreme temperatures and physical trauma that would be fatal to most organisms. But to be even more specific, the xenomorph possesses what we call a mesoskeleton, a remarkable fusion of an insect-like exoskeleton and a mammalian endoskeleton, with the latter likely derived from its hosts. We'll come back to that. For now, you'll also notice the creature's tail, nearly as long as its body and ending in a sharp, bladed tip. This tail serves multiple functions, as a balance organ, a propulsive aid when swimming, and as a deadly weapon in combat. And of course, its most distinctive feature is undoubtedly its elongated, cylindrical head. The xenomorph's head is a sophisticated sensory array, compensating for the creature's apparent lack of lens-based visual organs. Along the sides of the extended skull, we find highly developed sensory structures capable of detecting atmospheric vibrations, something like the lateral line found in sharks and other fish, but far more advanced. But how do they navigate without eyes? Scans indicate that behind the creature's frontal plate lie highly sensitive thermoreceptive organs. These allow the xenomorph to detect heat signatures with astonishing precision. Xenomorphs are also clearly capable of detecting pheromones, which allows them to locate prey and distinguish between potential hosts and those already impregnated with a xenomorph embryo, an important distinction for their continued survival. But while the xenomorph's head houses this remarkable array of sensory organs, its most famous feature lies within the oral cavity. Let's now turn our attention to the xenomorph's signature weapon, its inner jaw. This is, perhaps, one of the most terrifying weapons in the biological world. It is a prehensile, piston-like appendage capable of extending up to half a meter from the creature's head. It's powered by an intricate system of extremely strong muscles housed within the xenomorph's elongated cranium, 
When the xenomorph prepares to strike, muscles along the external midsection of the head contract, driving the inner jaw forward with astonishing speed and force. The striking power of this organ has been estimated at between 70 to 100 pounds per square inch, easily capable of punching through bone and even some metals. Now on Earth, we do see analogous structures in some fish species, particularly moray eels. In eels, these pharyngeal jaws are a second set of tooth-bearing bones in the throat. They extend forward, grasp prey, and pull it deeper into the mouth. This allows the eel to swallow large prey without losing their grip. But the inner jaws of the xenomorph, while capable of performing a similar function, are likely not designed for food intake. Is the inner jaw used solely as a weapon then? Or does it serve other purposes? While its primary function is undoubtedly offensive, it is alleged that in some xenomorph variants, an apparently modified inner jaw can secrete the resin used in hive construction while in others, it may be used as a conduit for direct embryo implantation. Interesting. But if the inner jaw isn't primarily used for feeding, how do xenomorphs sustain themselves? That, Manta, leads us to one of the most perplexing aspects of xenomorph biology. While we have observed these creatures consuming organic matter, including humans, it doesn't appear to be their primary source of sustenance. But to understand the xenomorph's energy needs, we need to explore its infamous acid blood. Now don't worry, dear traveler, we won't be extracting any of this acid for this study. The risk of damage is simply too great. I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Of course. Now, while this extraordinary fluid is a hallmark of xenomorph biology, difficulty in extraction makes study quite difficult, and even now, little is known about its full composition and function. Is this substance actually blood? An excellent question, Manta. While commonly referred to as acid blood, the true nature of this fluid appears to be far more complex than a traditional circulatory medium. As to its exact composition, some researchers suggest it might be a form of concentrated sulfuric acid or hydrofluoric acid. Others propose more exotic compositions, such as a fluorocarbon or a chlorofluorocarbon compound. This latter theory could explain the violent explosions we sometimes observe when xenomorphs are set on fire as fluorocarbons are highly reactive with fire. What we do know for sure is that it's some form of molecular acid, incredibly potent yet quick to oxidize when exposed to air. We also know that this acid is present in all stages of the xenomorph's life cycle, from ovomorph to adult, and its primary function appears to be energetic rather than circulatory. Research indicates that this fluid acts as a kind of biological battery, generating a powerful bioelectric charge through chemical reactions. This unique energy system may explain the xenomorph's ability to survive in extreme environments, including the vacuum of space, and could account for the species' incredibly efficient metabolism. But it's the relationship between this acid and the traditional circulatory functions where things get fuzzy. While it's possible that the acid serves some metabolic function, perhaps as an extreme analog to stomach acid for digestion, we simply can't confirm that it carries oxygen or nutrients in the way that blood does in terrestrial organisms. Of course, the most relevant function of this acid blood, at least to the humans who have encountered this creature, is defensive. You see, when a xenomorph is injured, the released acid can dissolve through almost any material posing a significant threat to attackers. This defensive capability is so ingrained that xenomorphs have been observed deliberately wounding themselves or their brethren to use the acid offensively. Yikes, but how do the xenomorphs contain such a corrosive substance within their bodies? What a phenomenal question. Their internal tissues appear to be lined with a bioorganically produced fluorine-based compound similar to Teflon making it incredibly resistant to damage of any kind. Now, while we're on the subject of the xenomorph's internal systems, let's turn our attention to another aspect of their biology, respiration. The most visible feature of which is a series of tube-like dorsal spines protruding from their backs. It appears that these dorsal tubes function as a crucial part of the xenomorph's respiratory system, acting as atmospheric filters similar to the spiracles found in terrestrial insects. They allow the creature to breathe in a variety of environments, including underwater, by absorbing oxygen without inhaling the water. But we've clearly seen that xenomorphs can survive in space. How is that possible? Indeed, Manta. This very fact leads me to believe that they possess an incredibly adaptable system, 
capable of shutting down entirely when necessary. During these periods, I theorize that the xenomorph relies solely on its internal battery system, the acidic blood we described earlier, for energy. After all, as we observed in our study of the xenomorph's life cycle, an ovomorph can remain viable for centuries thanks to this acidic compound. Why couldn't the same thing apply to the adult? Interestingly, not all xenomorph variants possess dorsal tubes, which indicates further adaptability in their respiratory capabilities depending on their host or environment. And as a matter of fact, this brings us nicely to the next phase of our study of the xenomorph, a subject so unusual that it almost seems to border on the supernatural. I am speaking of the xenomorph's incredible ability to incorporate genetic traits from its host, resulting in a wide variety of phenotypes across many different environments. Oh good, I was hoping we'd cover this. Your hope is my… uh… guide. Anyway, as with most things relating to this creature, the mechanism behind the xenomorph's genetic adaptability is complex and not fully understood. However, it is estimated that during its early development, the xenomorph embryo copies approximately 10 to 15 percent of the host's genetic code, a process that serves multiple purposes. First, it helps the developing xenomorph hide from the host's immune system. Second, and perhaps more importantly, by adopting characteristics of an organism native to that environment, the xenomorph becomes better suited to its surroundings. What kind of traits can xenomorphs inherit from their hosts? Well, the most obvious inherited traits are related to general stature and locomotion. For example, as we alluded to previously, xenomorphs born from quadrupedal hosts tend to be more streamlined and move on all fours. Those born from bipedal hosts, like humans, maintain an upright posture. In more extreme cases, such as when a yautja serves as a host, the resulting xenomorph, also known as a predalien, may exhibit distinct features like mandibles and dreadlock-like appendages as well as behaviors reminiscent of their hosts, including the ritualistic mutilation of prey. Manta, could you define Yautja for anyone unfamiliar? The Yautja are a sentient, humanoid extraterrestrial species, characterized by their hunting of other dangerous species for sport and honor, including humans, known colloquially as predators. Exactly. That's a species that may warrant its own exploration in the future. Returning to the xenomorph, however, the key to their genetic adaptability lies in a substance known as Plagiaris prepotens, a highly mutagenic compound introduced into the host by the facehugger. It's a variant of a pathogen known as chemical A0-3959X.91-15, which was originally used by the engineers in their bioengineering experiments. I'm throwing a lot at you here, but don't worry. We've explored more about how this works in another expedition, and we'll be covering these substances in far more detail in the future. Suffice it to say that Plagiaris prepotens has the remarkable ability to accrue biomass from its surroundings and, given the right conditions, transform from a single-celled organism into a fully formed xenomorph in a matter of mere hours. You see, Plagiaris prepotens contains highly specialized enzymes that can rapidly unwind and read DNA strands. It's estimated that it can process genetic information at rates thousands of times faster than even our most advanced sequencing technologies. Okay, but how does this genetic information translate into physical changes in the xenomorph? Ah, now here's where things get even more interesting. The assimilated genetic information serves as a blueprint for the developing xenomorph conglomeration. As it grows, it expresses these acquired genes in various ways, resulting in sometimes unpredictable phenotypes. For example, as previously mentioned, when a xenomorph gestates in a quadrupedal host like a dog, the Plagiaris prepotens might assimilate genes related to locomotion and body structure. This results in a xenomorph with a more elongated, streamlined form adapted for four-legged movement, what we call a runner variant. But while the xenomorph's adaptability is remarkable, the base xenomorph genome remains largely intact. We never see a xenomorph completely transform into its host species, for example. And yet, interestingly, scans reveal that the host's genetic material can influence the xenomorph's form, even in ways that may not provide any direct benefit to the creature. 
How so? Well, you may notice that the xenomorph's skull, particularly the front portion, bears a striking resemblance to a human skull, complete with nasal openings and ocular sockets, despite the fact that these features likely serve no practical purpose for the xenomorph. Instead, I theorize that this human-like skull structure is probably a result of the creature's frequent gestation in human hosts. In any case, the ability to rapidly adapt to new environments and hosts is perhaps the xenomorph's greatest strength. It allows the species to thrive in a wide range of habitats and to overcome the defenses of nearly any species. But believe it or not, the xenomorph's adaptability extends beyond physical traits to its cognitive capabilities. And indeed, these creatures demonstrate a level of intelligence that is both fascinating and terrifying. In short, xenomorphs exhibit intelligence quite comparable to primates. They possess remarkable problem-solving skills and observational learning capabilities. We've observed them quickly adapting to new environments, even learning to operate basic machinery after a single observation. More impressively, xenomorphs have demonstrated the ability to find creative, counterintuitive solutions to problems and to communicate with other members of its species using vocalizations. But in fact, it's believed that the majority of their communication occurs through other means, most likely involving pheromones. Even more intriguing is the theory that xenomorphs are bioelectrically networked in a collective hive consciousness. This would allow for near instantaneous communication, simultaneous learning, and unified action among all individuals in a hive. This particular aspect of xenomorph biology will require much further study to determine for certain. Speaking of things that require much more study, Manta, did you know that the xenomorph we've been observing today is not the only terrifying humanoid abomination to arise from certain applications of Plagiaris prepotens? Not only did I not know that, but I also have no idea what you're talking about. That makes sense. It can be a little confusing. That's why I've already chartered explorations not only into the origins of this creature, but also the mutagenic substance that seems so closely tied to it and multiple other less refined species. For now, let's put this specimen back where we found it. I have a feeling it has a big part to play in the future. Please select our next destination on the screen in front of you. Brace yourselves, beginning ascent in three, two, one.